Church and Leach here at Malden. We're glad each one of you are here with us tonight. I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin this morning. Let's remember all the shut ins that's in the bulletin, our sick that's in the bulletin. We have many that's out sick right now. So let's, uh, I know John had announced a bunch of them this morning. Also, I'm going to add a couple more to that. Uh, Deborah Clark called Joe. She's going to see the doctor Thursday. I think she's going to have some surgery on Thursday. Too, right? Yeah. She's supposed to have some surgery this coming Thursday. <clears throat> also, uh, this would be Joe's uh, brother. It'd be his sister-in-law, Kathy Mormon in Pennsylvania. She's been having a hard time right lately. She's been in back and forth in the hospital. Now they've called out hospice. So uh, and she's at home. So let's keep that family and keep her in her. Also, it's good to see Tanya back this evening. Glad you're doing better where you can come out. And are we going to do the uh, personal work groups after service? Personal work groups is going to be after uh, the evening service. Anybody can say and help with that would be greatly appreciated. And this coming Friday night will be the men's planning session, so men remember that. I think it'll be at 7 o'clock. I think Dennis said he was going to cook steak and baked potato and salad, whatever we need. <laughs> I'm just kidding. On that. <laughs> Into our service tonight, our song leader will be Joel Foster. Our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joel Maddox, and we'll begin our worship service with others. Pray with you, please bow with me. Our kind of loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this time we can be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for your Son as he came to this earth, lived and died as a man, hung on that cruel cross, shed his blood. 
each and every one of us that if we do thy will, we can have a home within in eternity. I also pray at this time that you'll be with all of our ones that's in our bulletin, all of our shut-ins. Pray that you'll be with them. <coughs> and pray uh, the ones that take care of them and comfort them at this time. Also be with the ones all over them that are sick. Especially be with the ones that's going to be having <coughs> surgeries this coming week. Pray that you'll be with the doctors and nurses that take care of them, that they may return back to their health. Also pray that you'll be with Kathy Mormon in Pennsylvania. Pray that you'll comfort her and be with her family at this time. <clears throat> and also pray, thank you for the ones that have been out sick and back with us. Thank you for the, uh, allowing them to recover where they can come back and be with us. Also pray at this time that you'll be with the church here, the church the world over. I also pray that each and everything we say and do here will, also, will always be in accordance with thy will. Pray at this time that you'll be with the, our leaders of our nations. Pray that they will look unto you for guidance and they will do things that is pleasing unto you and according to thy will. I also pray that you'll be with the ones on military ones, especially ones on foreign souls. Pray that you'll keep them safe and return them back to their families. Pray, pray that you'll be with Brother Joel tonight as we leave their singing. Pray that each one of us will lift up our voices of praise unto you. Also pray that you'll be with Brother Dennis tonight. He has very recollection things to study. Pray he'll preach and unto us in a way that all of us can understand learn and do more of thy will and be more Christ-like. Pray that you'll be with us as we go through our work weeks this week, especially that we can, our uh, fellow workers, they'll look unto us and they'll see that we're Christians by our actions and by the ways we do things. Also, I pray that you'll be with us to always guard, guide, direct us, and forgive us all of any sins. Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Three, six, two. Three, six, two. <clears throat> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory. Sunfold black flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of a mortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Sweet. 
midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. <coughs> Excuse me. Four, three, five. Four, three, five. comes and speaks to us. Five, eight, five. Five, eight, five. <clears throat> Stand then in his grave. 
Our text tonight comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. And the Bible reads, Have you heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy? But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he who makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. One of the hardest words for me to grasp in these words is that word perfect. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I don't know about you, but for me that seems to be impossible. How could Jesus call on us to be at the level of perfection where God exists? Now, every translation that I looked at this week uses that word perfect. And every commentary that I have read this week in researching that language comes, all of them, to the same conclusion. That that word perfect is not the best English word to use. And so I dig some more digging in the concordance and the Greek dictionary. And there were other definitions there for that word that for some reason, the translators had translated as perfect. Some of them said it was the definition, some were the thought of complete, maturity, full to its purpose, without blemish, or accomplishing a goal. Now with those other words, it really changes the last sentence of this reading. If our calling by Christ is to bring completion to the goal that was set forth to us the same way that God brings to completion the goals that he has set forth, then it is possible for us to be perfect in the sense that God is perfect. But I don't want to look at the word perfect enough. What I want to look at is the how. How can we accomplish the goal that this brings forth, that maturity of love in the context of loving our enemies? Now, God taught the Jews that they were to love more than just God. And there's no doubt that the greatest command is to love God. There was Moses who, who said to the people in Deuteronomy 6 and verses 4 and 5 that Jesus also had reiterated later on. Where he, Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And for the most part, the people Jesus talked to said that they would love God. And if the truth was told, it wasn't really true. Now we can look at the account of the rich young ruler who, who claimed to love God. But he only loved God to the extent that fit his idea of love. And Jesus challenged him as to which he loved more. His riches or God. But we'll set that aside for a moment. There's another command that the Jews were familiar with, and that was to love your neighbor. The phrase is used in Leviticus 19 and verses 17 and 18. That you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance, or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
I am the Lord. You know, it was this part here that brought about the debate on who was your neighbor. And, and to help in that debate, Jesus gave us the parable of the Good Samaritan. For the Jews, it seemed that their neighbor was a fellow Jew and that they were to treat them as God would want to treat that person. But Jesus challenged them. Paul takes this phrase, Romans 13, and he pushes the meaning of it. In verses 8 through 10, Paul writes, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You know, the command of and the calling of hospitality became the benchmark, if you will, of the early church. It is one of those identifying marks of a church leader. And that hospitality, by biblical definition, involves showing kindness to strangers, not just Christians, not just Jews. So instead of trying to limit the term neighbor, let's go back to the text and see what Jesus speaks of concerning who we are to love. Verses 43 and 44 of Matthew 5. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I will talk about some facts for just a moment. A lot of people, and Christians included, are not easy to love. One of those reasons that we, is that we love ourselves and most people are not like us. We can love our fellow Christians because we know that we are family and we have the same spiritual goals. We can love other people who are at least kind to us. But if we define love as showing respect and kindness and the desire for their general well-being, then we can love nice people. That's not what Jesus is calling for us to do. He calls on us to a more mature love, a godlike love. In fact, Jesus gives the example that God makes the sun to rise on everyone, not just the ones who love him. That God allows the rain to affect everyone, not just the ones who love him. The completion of the goal of love is to learn the way God loves everyone. It calls for us to take, a part, take part in two actions. To love our enemies and to pray for our enemies. We have that word that translates from love, agape. That all-inclusive love. That the love that never diminishes because of who we're dealing with and what we're dealing with. And no matter what they do for us or do to us, that love is always the same. Love your enemy. Jesus asked, who is my neighbor? And we got the parable of the Samaritan showing kindness to a probable Jew. The question then comes, who is our enemy? It's answered by telling us that it's the people who oppose us. You know, there is one passage of Scripture that a lot of Christians like, but they like it for the wrong reason. 
And it's a little long, but it's found in Romans 12. That's in verses 14 through 21, eight verses. Paul writes here, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good thoughts. Now, how many of us smile at the thought of pouring burning coals over someone's head that does us wrong? But that is the exact opposite of what the Scripture teaches. The passage is the practicality side of loving our enemies. When we do good to them as described to you, they will take that step back with their mouths open and they will not know how to respond. In that way, it is like someone had dumped a bunch of burning coals on their head and there's nothing they can do about it. We love them because love is the basis of our Christian character. It's why love is generally at the top of the list of those Christian graces. Our genuine love for people who don't like us often frustrates them because they don't know how to respond to that kind of kindness. And the second teaching from Jesus is that we pray for those who persecute us. What do we pray for? Do we pray for the coals that come raining down on their head? Do we want fire, God to bring down fire to consume them in order to vindicate us? That's not what Jesus wants. The prayer that we need to pray for those who persecute us is a prayer that they will change. It's praying that God will bring about a good change in their lives. It is a prayer that will bring salvation to them. I can say with confidence that most of us here, all of us here, have read the account of Jonah. It's easy. It's a four-chapter book in the, in the Bible, and it's very quick to read. But what is the most read section of that account? What do we remember the most about? It's the great fish. Being swallowed by that great fish. But if we look closer to that account, the reason that Jonah ran away, in Jonah chapter 4 in the first two verses, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. The truth is, and Jonah kind of let it slip out, he wanted God to destroy Nineveh. He wanted his enemies gone. But God wanted them to change. And in Jonah's displeasure, they did change. Because after they changed, he was moping around like you wouldn't believe. <clears throat> Jonah didn't understand that aspect of God because it wasn't Jonah's desire. Or prayer for these 
people to change. We have to change if we want our world to change. We're going out Tuesday to see if we can't make a change in the direction our nation is headed. And if you listen to both sides of the coin, what do we hear? Division and hatred. Why can't we build a bridge between the two and speak of the issues and work them out together? Hopefully we can make a change in the direction our country is headed. Maybe we can find a way of peace between us and what divides us. But friends, that's not going to happen if we do not pray for our enemies, if we do not pray for those who persecute us. God can cause their hearts to change. We keep it up. And sin is an enemy of God. And when a person lives in sin, they live as an enemy. In James 4 and verse 4, James writes, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Tonight, just as this morning, Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. And he wants the enemy to open it to him so that the feast of fellowship can begin. If you listen to everyone on the outside world, heaven is full. Everybody that has ever lived and died is in heaven. Everyone. Why can't we, starting this evening, make it our goal to get as many people as we can because heaven is not going to be as full as we think. There is going to be a lot of empty spaces. And I certainly don't want any of us on that last great day being asked the question, why didn't you do more? So let us, as Jesus is going to pray for our enemies, those who oppose us, those who persecute us, let us pray for them, that God will turn their hearts. Tonight, if you are not a child of God, we want to give you the opportunity, the opportunity to change your life. Jesus is at the door. He's knocking. All you have to do is open. Through repentance and confession, through that New Testament baptism, have your sins washed away. You can have the hope of heaven. You can have the joy. You can be free from that bondage of sin. And you can begin a new life. If you are a child of God and you need our prayers or you need in some way to make things right with God, we want to give you that opportunity as together we stand and we sing. Will you come, will you come with your poor broken heart, burden and sin oppressed? Lay it down at the feet of your Savior and Lord. Jesus will give you rest.
come in simple trusting faith, Jesus will give you rest. Where you come, where you come, how he pleads with you now. for the Lord's Supper. How many of you okay? Do you have the Lord's Supper? Oh, very good. Um, don't forget, next Sunday is our fellowship meal in honor of veterans. Um, it'll be our last fellowship meal of the year. Um, so we don't typically have one in December with the holidays and everything and Thanksgiving towards the end of the year. So uh, please remember uh, that this coming week. We have our personal works group right after our services tonight. So if any can stay with and help with that, it would be deeply appreciated. If there's nothing further, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the many blessings that you have given us throughout our lives. We're thankful for the opportunity that we could come here today and sing songs of praise and sing of these, to hear a portion of our words spoken unto us, to pray that we will take these things and apply them to our lives that we will teach others, that we will be good examples unto others also. We pray that you would be with our shut-ins, that you would watch over them. We pray that you would be with the ones that are sick, the ones that are traveling. We're thankful for the ones that have been sick and have been able to come back and worship with you. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us, and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Oh, that's all.